for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. The creationist response to these problems is that, well, Neanderthals were hypermutating. They had faster mutation rates, and that explains why they're so different from the rest of Homo sapiens. Even though they share a common ancestor, we we can explain those differences based on the fact that they just experience more mutations. Now, that's not the case. This claim is just a post hoc addition to the creationist model to solve the unsolvable problems that we just identified. In fact, if you claim Neanderthals were hypermutating, you actually create more problems. For example, based on the available genomes, Neanderthals had less genetic diversity than extant humans. So here's a paper talking about how Neanderthals were highly inbred. And if you look at that and you see how they're lacking in genetic diversity, well, lacking in genetic diversity is incompatible with being hypermutating. Because if you experience a lot of mutations, what are you generating? More genetic diversity. So the hypermutating hypothesis is just contradicted by the data. <clears throat> According to our model, the early post-flood human population, let's say between 1,000 to 10,000, was split apart at Babel, okay? And a lot of these subgroups, the Neanderthals being one of them, they would have split off into harsh environmental conditions, of course, but not only that, they would be isolated and therefore uh, inbreeding would take place. And we see that in, in their genome. They have high levels of homozygosity, 40% less fit than modern humans, um, highly inbred. You know, nobody would disagree with that fact. But here's the thing. The fact that different groups went different directions on the globe and each saw different, what, environmental pressures. They experienced different demographic pressures. They were subject to different mutational events. For example, the Neanderthals, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that they were hyper mutating. Um, now, somebody like Dr. Dan has a very unscientific argument against the hyper mutation hypothesis. Um, he'll say because they're highly inbred, which reduces genetic diversity, that means they cannot also be hyper mutating because mutations by definition add diversity. Okay, um, David, uh, I'll let you take 10 seconds of my time. Would you agree with Dr. Dan that hyper mutation and in inbreeding can't go hand in hand? Um, I, would, I would, for the most part, I would agree with Dr. Dan. What would be your reasoning why? Well, I guess we can see the same thing in like the cheetah population and other populations today that are highly inbred. And we simply don't see the hypermutation that we would see in the Neanderthal population. No, um, what he's saying is because they're highly inbred, which means they had low levels of genetic diversity, they had lower le levels of genetic diversity compared to modern humans. That means by definition, they couldn't have been hyper mutated. But let me ask you the question, okay? Especially if we're looking at the mitochondrial DNA, for example, and why they're um, very divergent from, from humans, okay? So like, for example, um, African populations have more DNA differences and diversity than non-Africans. And Neanderthals have even more than that in their mitochondrial DNA. Now, let me ask you, uh, David, what DNA compartment is larger, the nuclear D uh, DNA or the mitochondrial DNA? Um, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. I believe it is the um, mitochondrial DNA. No, the so for example, the nuclear DNA is about 3.4 billion letters. The mitochond so with the nuclear DNA, we inherit two copies. Okay, we get three billion letters from mom, three billion letters from dad. And during sexual recombination, of course, uh, you know, genetic material is swapped, and that's where we get novel phenotypes and uh, diversity, of course. <laughs> now, here's the You're thing. A legend. You're a legend, standing for truth. I mean, Brother honestly, Jason. They, they just cannot, they just cannot refute you in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. It's <laughs> so funny to watch. I haven't so gotten funny. my turn. I haven't gotten my turn to refute <laughs> standing for truth. Oh, no. yet, so oh, let's no. not let's not jump to conclusions there, Jason. <laughs> We're gonna have fun, and Jason, I'm glad you're here. This is gonna be a good night. Okay, so. 
Um, yeah, so the fact is mitochondrial DNA, and you can Google it, David, it's only 16,000 letters long. Yeah. Very, very small DNA compartment. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, I'm sorry. I got, I, I'm hyper dyslexic, and sometimes these terms just get mixed up in my mind. So, yeah, you're, you're definitely correct with that. It is definitely the nuclear DNA. What's the nuclear DNA? Oh, I'm hyper dyslexic as well, but I can play the truth. <laughs> I'll put it this way, and 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 nothing against you, David. If I'm if any of us would have got that question wrong in Doctor Dan's uh, challenge, we never would have been able to live that down. So, but it's okay. It's it's a learning opportunity. But and, and this is why Doctor Dan his challenge is a little bit like he's posturing because Dr. the Dan's fact that you got that like question a little wrong, bit like a child. Now it is it is kind him. of. It is kind of basic genetics, you know, that the mitochondrial DNA is only 16,000 letters long versus the nuclear DNA. But that's okay that you, because you don't need to know everything for us to have a good conversation. But Dr. Dan seems to think that, you know, we all need to uh, take his evolutionist pop quiz in order to have a discussion about these issues. So I, I just want to point out that I think his challenge is a little bit, uh, has to do with posture. Childish. So, childish. Yeah, I would agree. So. Uh, yeah, so let, let, let me refute. Uh, this isn't the first time I've refuted Dr. Dan on this, but this means, okay, since we agree on the size differences between nu nuclear uh, DNA and mitochondrial DNA, the hypermutation would have a big effect, okay, an incredibly big effect on uniparentally inherited DNA, okay? As we talked about earlier, that's your mitochondrial DNA. And, uh, David, do you know what our other uh, uniparentally inherited DNA is? Amazing. Okay. So it's, it's our Y chromosome, of course, right? So that's passed on from father to sons. And mitochondrial DNA is passed on from mothers to... We only get mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. So now for biparentally inherited DNA, like the nuclear DNA, for one, created heterozygosity would still apply, okay? So that means Neanderthals would already have had millions of created differences. Here's the thing the corresponding increase due to the hypermutation would be virtually undetectable in the, in the nuclear genome. The reason why is because there's 3.4 billion letters. So a few extra mutations, it's not going to counterbalance the what? The inbreeding. The inbreeding would be the biggest problem and would have the greatest impact on the nuclear genome. But that uniparentally inherited DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, that can be more diverse because it's only 16,000 letters long. And when you have that hypermutation taking place, you're going to get more diversity and you're going to get more DNA differences. So Dr. Dan is wrong. I've said it many times and he just needs to concede the point. It's entirely scientific to have the biparentally inherited DNA, the nuclear DNA, be less diverse from inbreeding than modern humans, of course, because that's what we're looking at with genetic markers, and the uniparentally inherited DNA be more diverse. And that's exactly what we see in the Neanderthals. So people like Dr. Dan need to come up with better arguments as far as I'm concerned.